This week we released Unreal Engine 4.25, which can be downloaded from the Epic Games Launcher and from GitHub. Make sure you go to unrealengine.com and check out the blog, which shares many of the new features, but you can also go to documentation page, and on the left side you'll find the release notes. Some of the great new features in this release include support for the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X, as well as Unreal Engine Insight improvements. One of the things I'm really excited about is that Niagara is now fully production ready. We've also done some major improvements to the shading models. This includes uh, support for anisotropic materials, which you can see on the wheels of this car. We've also got physically based translucency, which helps improve the clear coat system, which you can see here on this particular render, which is absolutely stunning. Something I'm excited about is also the chaos physics systems, which got a nice major update and can be uh, worked with inside of Unreal Engine 4.25. We also have the high quality media exporter. The audio system has gotten a major update. We also now have LiDAR support inside of Unreal Engine 4.25 improvements to the HoloLens 2 system, major improvements to the ray tracing system, improvements to AI. Something I'm also excited about is the control rig improvements, which allow you to set up full rigs for our skeletal mesh systems and work with them inside of sequencer to pose characters and, and actually do full animations. We've done things to improve our variant manager, live USD support, and things like improving our eye adaptation and hair and fur render, and I'm barely a quarter way through the release notes. Make sure that you go to the Epic Games Launcher, download Unreal 4.25, and start working with these amazing new features. Uh, they're there waiting for you. For those of you new to Unreal Online Learning, you can gain access to it by going to unrealengine.com, Learning and Support, and Online Learning. Here you will find free Unreal Engine video tutorials as well as full guided learning paths for all different things inside of Unreal Engine as well as Twin Motion and the Quixel ecosystem. If we take a look at the content library, here you'll see that we have it broken down into categories including games, architecture, automotive transportation, broadcast live events, film television, as well as the foundations for the engine. These are really high quality courses that take you through everything including blueprints, materials, full kickstarters for animation, uh, really focused courses on um, doing visualization for architectural spaces, introduction to global illumination, real-time rendering fundamentals, post-processing, building better pipelines. Uh, there's some really detailed material on here for sequencer, full in-depth courses into the rendering and how Unreal Engine renders, sequencer training for cinematic shot production. Uh, this is amazing, amazing content. It's broken down into learning paths, collections. You can favorite things. It's broken down into different languages, including Japanese and Korean and Chinese. Uh, you can actually search the entire library, and once you complete a course, let's take a look at one of the ones that I created, uh, you'll see that they're broken down into different videos that have full assessments, and once you get through the whole thing, you will actually gain a badge that will be tracked as achievements, micro-credentials. And if we go and take a look at your actual profile in here, these things will start to stack up. Uh, you can see that I actually need to do a few more, but as you complete them, you can actually share them on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and kind of show your progress as you're learning uh, Unreal Engine and Twin Motion and all the other things. So uh, be sure to come in here and check this out. This is an amazing learning resource. Once, once again, 100% for free, a great learning resource for instructors to uh, assign to students that are learning Unreal Engine and a good uh, flipped learning model as well. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's stream. Today we welcome our friend David Beach, who is an Associate Professor of Architecture at Drury University. And we've got an exciting uh, uh, stream today about twin motion, uh, specifically for education. That's David over there in the lower, I guess to everyone down here. Oh, yep. Oh, oh. Over there. Right. That way. No, I think he's over there. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Brady Bunch over here. Well, gosh, I guess maybe I'm showing my age. But uh, yeah, we've got an exciting uh, stream 
uh, scheduled today. So um, really the focus of today's stream is twin motion, which uh, hopefully that uh, you've all had a chance to explore. It's a, a really exciting tool set that um, uh, really sits on top of Unreal Engine and throws you immediately into real time. And I think that this is a really good opportunity for me to hand it off to Tom, who's going to talk a little bit of, about real time first, and then we're going to talk about twin motion. Uh, and I know we've done some great streams about twin motion and talked about it a fair amount, but this is our opportunity once again on these Friday streams to talk about how it relates specifically to the education community, what it means to students, what it means to educators, what it means to folks that maybe are teaching on YouTube, that are teaching in training centers, that are, that are working to support others in studios. Uh, and uh, what it means to getting access to it, because uh, one thing that's really amazing is that Twin Motion is completely free for those people working uh, in universities and educational institutions. So, uh, without further ado, let me hand it over to Tom. A little later on, uh, David's going to jump in and is going to do a full demonstration and build some amazing stuff. Uh, but first, uh, once again, welcome to Mark up there. He's uh, the uh, uh, education manager in, uh, in EMEA, and so it's always a pleasure to have him with us, and he'll be helping answer questions in chat. Uh, but now let me hand it to, to Tom over there. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah, it's, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about today's stream, because this is something that's pretty near and dear to my heart, which is visualization, which is something I did for pretty much, well, over a decade, but I was doing viz in game engines for about a decade and using Unreal for about a decade um, before coming to Epic. Uh, and so I'm really excited about twin motion in general because it's, uh, it, it's, it's a huge, huge change in the level of effort that you need to put forth to kind of achieve quality visualization um and it's it's a, it really speaks to what uh interactive 3d is and so uh, i'm i have to have lewis be my my screen sharer because uh my laptop broke so i'm on an ipad here and um so uh lewis will you bring up the what is interactive 3d web page so um interactive 3d is um, kind of what we're calling uh, a lot of what people are doing. Oh, wait, there it is. Cool. Uh, uh, what people are doing with with uh, Unreal Engine and game engines, you know, within games and outside of games. And uh, um, and it's a, it's a really interesting, uh, an interesting topic because it's, it's uh, it's new to a lot of people, and I think we have a lot of people who are joining us on these streams. That a lot of this is just completely new, and um, you know, I I've been doing it for so long that it's hard for me to imagine it being brand new. Um, and so we've kind of taken a step back and asked ourselves if I had never really you know played with a game engine or done any rendering at all, what what would all this mean? Um, and so we kind of uh, took a step back and um, uh, we, we, uh, we took a look at that and we've built up this blog and we did a nice video that's hosted by uh, Amanda, our community manager. Um, and it really goes into depth into what people are doing with real time within games and entertainment, and manufacturing, um, and really uh, digs into why this is happening now. Uh, and and kind of um, the results of it and where we see things are going. And we talk about some stuff here that I know, uh, David, uh, we talked about a bit, which is uh, how fast things render um, in real time versus offline and, and the just absolute vast difference. An example I like to use is that real-time rendering, rendering in a game engine versus like a traditional rendering that you would do in a movie or for ArcViz uh, 
you know, let's say a, a movie frame took an hour to render, or an art biz frame took an hour to render, which is optimistic. Um, if you're rendering at 30 frames a second, you're rendering 108,000 times faster, um, which is such a complete game changer that um, everyone is 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 switching over to that, and it's becoming, you know, an obvious an obvious thing that you know who wants to render at an, a frame an hour when you can render at you know thirty to sixty ninety frames a second. Uh, using a game engine. Um, and so that kind of segues into what we're talking about today, which is Twin Motion, which is an application built in Unreal. So it's a game, essentially, that you play to do serious stuff, <laughs> to build environments. Um, so it's, it's, it's essentially a game that um, that you use to build environments. The game was built in Unreal. Um, and so uh, it's not targeted really towards game players. It's targeted towards architects and designers uh, who want to see what their work will look like. And traditionally, this was done by taking this, your design or your CAD data from Revit or SketchUp or Max or CAD or wherever you had it from and bringing that into Max or Maya um, and then using V-Ray or something to make materials and lighting. And then you wait a very long time to get a render. Um, and it was kind of a, a slow workflow. <laughs> um, but it was essential because um, communicating uh, these designs and showing them in context and helping people make decisions was worth all of that effort um, because uh, because it's really expensive to make decisions. Uh, so anything that you can do to make that cheaper um, and, and visualization is one of those things that makes it not just cheaper but more reliable. Um, and so you know for for decades we've been doing viz the old-fashioned way and building big render farms and waiting a long time for renders and a long time for feedback um and so an application like this where we can take that design data feed it directly into it and start seeing what it looks like uh, and iterating on it in real time is it's such a game changer that pretty much anyone that that experiences it really can't go back. If I, <laughs> anytime I go back and have to hit render and Max or Maya buckets pop up and I have to wait for it, I just, I die a little bit inside of us. <laughs> Shall we play the reel so that we can share with them uh, sort of a, just a quick look at what the uh, Twin Motion is capable of? Yeah, ready? yeah All absolutely. Right. Let's do it. So, uh, these are a couple of uh, of twin motion um, feature reels and uh, just a couple of quick workflow reels, and then we'll we'll be back.
What crazy magic is that? Pretty That's amazing. impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. So maybe you all realize uh, who are watching the stream that uh, most of us, except for Tom, have gray hair on the stream. <laughs> <laughs> They're in there. <laughs> Which means that, uh, you know, they've I, just all fallen out for myself. You know, I started doing this work, um, you know, in the early 90s. And uh, I'll never forget working in an animation house in the early 90s when we would do animation and going from right for any frame, like frame, whatever, 20 to 21 took three minutes to update a frame. Right. And so <laughs> what we're looking at, you know, here in twin motion is where you can lay down a curve and then just have people and cars and bicycles just animating by the dozens along that curve. And it just, a to, just to see what's going on there is just remarkable. And then trees growing, and then you can change <laughs> and have snow on everything. And, you know, okay, so, but there's all that. But then it's free. What are, you know, and, and then the other thing that I think is important is that, you know, last year we released Twin Motion and it was free for everyone. And then just earlier this year, there was a major update to Twin Motion 2020. And now it's free for education, right? And that's one of the reasons to have this stream is because, you know, it's not especially free for everyone, but for the education community, it's still free. And one of the reasons we're going to talk today and one of the things we want to make sure that this community is completely aware uh, where you can go and get it, what it means for it to be free for education, what it means for it to present it to your students, what it means to make sure that um, even if you're teaching game design, if you're teaching game environment workflows, not just architecture, not just you know what you think this tool is meant for, this this can be used for many things. I think that you know it's not unlikely that Epic will make inroads from Twin Motion directly into Unreal Engine, so you can build all these environments and and, and then use them in the future for filmmaking, use them in the future for uh, game environments and so forth. So uh, this is a really amazing tool to use. And you will see very soon when David takes the, the steering wheel here, how easy it is to to assemble environments and, and do amazing, beautiful things um, without necessarily taking on the entire learning curve of Unreal Engine, which, you know, you may want to do anyway, because it will take you even to the next level, uh, which is really, really amazing. Did you have something to say, Mark? I'm sorry. I saw you move your mouth. Ah, it's <laughs> hard to see me move my mouth with this beard. Um, I was going to say, back in the old days, it used to take a weekend to calculate a radiosity solution. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And now you're moving and changing all global illumination, time of day, and having all, all of that stuff, and ambient occlusion calculate in real time, and then moving characters and cameras, and going into VR, and then manipulating it from an iPad. Uh, directly inside of twin motion, which is really, really amazing. Totally stunning. Okay, so some of the stuff we wanted to cover um, is exactly how to gain access to all of this amazing stuff. And so that you all know, um, now, you can go to twinmotion.com. And let me switch back over. Uh, Tom, did you want to add anything real quickly here before we switch over to that? Oh, go ahead. Okay, so you can go to twinmotion.com and it will take you to unrealengine twinmotion.com. And, and for those of you who are just not 100% aware, uh, Twin Motion is part of Epic Games. And so this is something that's offered through Epic Games. Um, and so if you go to twinmotion.com, it will take you to Unreal Engine uh, Twin Motion. And here you will basically get access to a lot of really valuable information. Um, and you can come down here and watch some really valuable videos. And then if you click on the getting started section here, it will take you to Twin Motion 2020, where uh, if you are a professional, of course, you'll get the option to go to a reseller channel and purchase Twin Motion. Of course, you can get a free trial of it. But what's really relevant to this community is that Twin Motion for Education is free for students and educators. And if you click on the Get Now, it will take you to a place where we will ask you some information about you know, who you are, what academic institution you are, and uh, ask you just some, some base questions that will then immediately get you access to it. Now, I went 
back here on the browser uh, because Another really important place to know about on the website is the community support section here. And if you click on Meet the Community, it'll take you to another really important section of the Twin Motion site, which is the Twin Motion Download and Resource section. And if you click on the Resource section here, this is a really valuable place. And it's, I think, you might need to know how to navigate to this section if you didn't get there the way I just showed you. But once again, that's that meet the community section. And if you get to the resources here, it's got a really helpful knowledge base uh, where you can get training, meet the, get to the Facebook groups. Uh, a really helpful link here is to the YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel is filled with a lot of really great videos. And I'm gonna pause this so we don't get that audio. You know, talks about what is Twin Motion, the release trailer, uh, really helpful videos that uh, talk about the different uh, tips and tricks, and the tons of webinars that have been done on uh, useful workflows, of course. And then another really good section here is um, you know the training section, and in here you can actually come down and on our online learning ma management system, our platform. We actually did a full course, an hour and 36 minute course that was done by one of our authors, Matt Doyle. And I have it open here somewhere, Introduction to Twin Motion. And you can start the course and really fantastic course that will take you through a lot of the workflows. And it's a fairly intuitive, you know, uh, program to work with because there's not a massive user interface as, as you will see when uh, David takes control here. But as we go back to this resource page, there's some other things that are really important to know. Uh, in here, there's also, let me see, a section that takes you into Twin Motion for Education that starts to really uh, ask some questions about, um, you know, of course it's free for education. We ask some basic questions about, uh, you know, who you are, your information, the school you come from. And then starts to talk about how to install Twin Motion in an educational setting. Now, a couple of things that are really important to know is that uh, we do help explain if you are wanting to install Twin Motion into a lab that has whatever 30, 60, 100 computers. Um, there's actually much easier ways than going from computer to computer and downloading Twin Motion. Now, once you gain access to Twin Motion in your Epic Games launcher, you will actually get a Twin Motion tab. So for those of you who are like, you know, I, I don't know where Twin Motion is, you'll see that this image shows you right here that here in the Epic Games launcher, there'll actually be a whole new tab that has Twin Motion in it, and then you'll be able to install it. But of course, you don't want to go to 30 computers or 60 or 100 computers and click install every time from here. So in this actual page, uh, you'll actually be able to go uh, here and read about how to deploy um, Twin Motion across all those computers by doing a basically a disk image of it. And uh, this page will actually take you through the process of installing it once and then duplicating that install. So uh, it can be really helpful uh, so that you can do it once and then not have to do it over and over again. And also, it's uh, it's worth noting that our, our licensing for educational institutions is um, is pretty non restrictive. So, um, as long as you install Twin Motion uh, with one account and sign the education EULA, um, you're free to install that on all the computers in your school. Um, uh, assuming that you have the authority to to sign a EULA like that for your school. Um, and yeah, we encourage you to uh, to clone um, clone the install to, to all the computers. Um, it's also worth it to note that the education version of uh, Twin Motion is exactly the same. It's literally just the EULA that you sign. It's the exact same version of of Twin Motion and it opens non-educational files and education files open in the commercial version. Um, there's no features that are changed or disabled or anything with the education version. Exactly. And the last thing I wanted to point out is that uh, there is a 
a offline installer that you can actually request here on this site as well. So it's another way to be able to install the engine. Uh, you have to actually request the online installer and fill out some information and, you know, sort of uh, describe why it is that you need it and, and validate. And, um, and this is something that we only really offer to academic institutions. Um, so just be aware that you can request an offline installer. This is not something that we typically um, release, but uh, it requires you to, I believe, to sign a, a, a EULA through the installer, a user license agreement. Uh, but it, it is something that can be made available in specific institutions uh, that don't use, for instance, disk images to install or, you know, that don't want to go in and, and install it um, in case by case basis. And I think that's kind of what I wanted to cover from here on the website. Uh, just be sure to go in and check out all these amazing videos here. Um, because these are some really helpful resources in general. Gentlemen, is there anything else that uh, you want to add? David, is there some stuff I know that you and your group have uh, really taken on and, uh, and blossomed within it? There's some amazing work that you've all been able to do already. How did you all learn? Um, so about two years ago at Autodesk University is when I first saw Twin Motion, um, and um, a few things just right away resonated with me um, beyond the quality. Um, first one really is um, anything that moves us. When I started teaching a little over a decade ago, um, just to go back to that idea of waiting for renderings, it used to be that we would have the signs that would show up on computers that said, don't touch um, rendering. And they would be on over overnight and in, into the next day often, um, waiting for computers to render a single image. Um, the idea of teaching design, um, we want our students to explore and iterate and reimagine and reimagine and edit. And right away, as I started looking at Twin Motion and talking with the team um, that was at uh, AU, I, I was, you know, yeah, this is a great tool. This is something that I can really um, teach quickly, which is important because I don't have a lot of time to teach software. I need to be teaching design. And this is something that, that the students um, will be able to explore their designs very thoroughly in. Um, and a, for instance, for that is the studio that I first really aggressively introduced Twin Motion to was this last fall. Their first assignment was actually to model a precedent building but only in sections. We only wanted them to model a small piece. And essentially they were, they were looking at historical buildings, famous buildings, renowned buildings. And from there, um, we put them all together in one file into a motion and then put on the VR headset and explored these famous sections. So that introduced them to the tool, it introduced them to the spatial concepts, the construction concept behind the building and how that informed the design on the inside. And we did that project in two weeks. So they launched the software, learned the software, and then we did a collaborative exploration of it all in a two-week time. Period. Um, so you know that's 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 how we started setting up the semester. So um, yeah, it's 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 um, as a teacher, it it kind of pulls back um, some of the technical issues that I've often had hoping that we could overcome. Yeah, that's pretty incredible to. To be able to to tackle something uh, a concept like a new piece of software and and then also actually be able to get to what you're trying to teach, which is in the software uh, in such a short period of time um, that's it's pretty incredible to have such such strong success like just right out the gate like that with with something but yeah i mean like lewis has said and you've said the tool set is so so intuitive and on the surface so straightforward um that you can achieve such good results and you know get back get back to your design software and and fix whatever's wrong or improve it or um is is really key so yeah How about I uh, show the uh, the reel that you sent me, Dave? Is that a good time? Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. And I, and I can, um, 
yeah, uh, talk a little bit about how we set that up and how we set the class up as well once the reels are. Okay, cool. So this is a reel that Dave sent me, and this is a, a well, I'll, I'll play it, and then you can share with us what it all is. That's beautiful work. That's amazing stuff. Yeah, so that's that is from my third year architecture studio. So those were third year architecture students, their first year in our professional program at the university. Um, that was um, they they had all had um, one class in three D modeling, uh, which our core models are Revit and Rhino, um, and then that was really their first launch into Twin Motion as a key visualization tool for the semester. So. We're talking about students learning to design. We're talking about students learning to do visualization. And um, as I often told them, if I pinned up my work from third year architecture, um, I, I would not have passed the course, I don't think, um, relative to what they were able to produce um, in a single semester. And selfishly speaking, I always start with saying I have amazing kids. I mean, the students that I get to work with are absolutely amazing and come up with um, inspiration and inspirational ideas, um, completely inspired work. Um, the premise of the studio is architectural tectonics. So we're looking at how um, materiality, constructability inform design and design thinking. And so as I started laying out a course and pairing software with a course, it really made sense to, um, uh, without hesitation, really jump in with Twin Motion as a key tool. Um, because again, what we were able to do then right away was just get students not just doing um, a model in Rhino and Revit and SketchUp, but um, immediately pushing, even if it's only 5% done or 10% done, into Twin Motion to start putting materials on it, to start exploring how that works, um, how it's going to look, how it's going to feel. And that was transformational in the student book. Um, quality of software aside, the ability to critique um, two weeks in, three weeks in, um, things that had a spatial quality and a materiality to them, a, a weight to them is, is something that's, I think, really primed to transform the way we can teach, the way we can push our students creatively, um, the requests that we can make of, let's render that again, let's take one more look at it, the request to put it into motion, um, because buildings to me are not stagnant still things. They're, um, they they live and breathe and move with the people in the community around them. Um, that's the type of world that I want to be able to create virtually to teach within. Uh, that's the kind of uh, design process I care for my students to go out and work with clients and communities to create, um, building that level of trust with designer and client, um, building that uh, sense of value in terms of the product that we create and the process that we put forth um, are really, really important to the industry. Um, so building that student, building that 
um, individual to leave our program to me is is vital. Now let me ask you a question. Uh, I I know that there, you know, I, I taught college for many years and and uh, would work with architecture professors who were very entrenched in you know just teaching the core principles of architecture and and uh, and didn't really get into visualization until maybe forever or you know maybe they would discuss visualization but it wasn't an important part of architecture um, curriculum um, do you guys put a lot of weight in the visualization aspect or you know how does the visualization aspect sort of factor into your um, architecture curriculum as a whole absolutely i would say we're balanced um there are still things with a pen and pencil that i'm never going to be able to do with the computer there's there's this sort of visceral quality about sculpting and drawing that is directly in tune with you as a creative however there are also things that i can do with the computer that i cannot do with a pen and pencil as well i i can't generate um 90 frames per second or 60 frames per second or 30 frames per second and move through a space understanding what the material palette is and how that's going to impact the design. Um, I, I, you know, try as I might, I can't put it into a VR headset and understand something that VR has never provided, uh, something we've never had before is, is how do we design with scale? We've had proportion. When we draw in perspective, we have proportion, but we've never had scale. How does your body actually relate to the space as a design tool? And, and those, those are things we can't do it without a computer. Um, so our approach here has been to be very balanced. Um, we start our students off in first year, pen, pencils, models. We start introducing the computer into first year. We fold it in. We have three classes solely dedicated to representation that start with traditional drawing methods, take us through basic 3D modeling and Photoshop. Um, in our first rep course, our second rep course is much more engaged. We're, we have now introduced twin motion into that course. Um, to do real-time visualization, uh, building information modeling, uh, advanced modelers like Rhino, um, a little bit of um, scripting to get that into the mix. And then our mm -hmm. REPS course is about constructability, construction documentation, and what it takes to sort of get all of these things built and put together in the real, real world, sort of transferring your imagination into something that's yeah, now before we get into, um, you know, handing the range over to you to show us, uh, not too long ago we released a showcase uh, of one of the largest architecture firms, HSK, you know, talking about building a stadium, um, you know, where they, you know, multi-billion dollar stadium where they probably have a couple hundred architects and, and people at the firm working on this massive, massive stadium. And they're all working in Unreal Engine and, and similar tools to Twin Motion. Um, and I was shocked to see just how many of those architects are deeply immersed every single day in getting their content into real time and putting it in front of the client. Um, you know, how important is that for someone now? Uh, and I know that one of the things that was really relevant about that piece is how much these large architecture firms are hiring real-time developers and how important that is. You know, is that really important? And, and what is the demand for people with this kind of skill set? And, and how does that factor into what you teach on a daily basis? I, I, think, I think the demand right now, um, it's, it's, I can really only speak more regionally uh, from where I'm at, um, but the demand is, is, uh, is really high. You know, in, in terms of architecture, most offices are going to require that, especially an, um, a younger em employee, a young architect, um, somebody new to the trade, is going to have to wear every single hat in office. So they are going to have to be able to meet with clients. They're going to have to be able to visit a site. They are going to have to take design direction and provide design direction. And they are going to have to provide visualization. Knowing that, um, the demand to be able to create these images quickly, um, to be able to create something that is compelling um, is really vital. Uh, I often talk about, you know, one of the next classes that I'm getting ready to teach that I'm really excited about really is turning all of this work and building it more uh, in terms of something cinematic in its quality, building narrative and story into visualization to not just treat it as there's the building, but how can we really make that visualization tell a story and teaching that as a tool? So I think 
building um, what I would say back to the question, building that visualization is important. I think in the very near future, it's not going to be seen as a byproduct, but just something everybody has to be able to do. So I think the next skill level, what I'm always trying to teach to is what's next is how do we use these tools to do, to, to make mini movies for our clients, to mm -hmm. make something that has the cinematic feel, um, this spatial quality, this ambience that really goes beyond showing the building, but really gets at what's the building about? What, how is it going to impact? How is it going to shape um, the space, the location that it's in? And I think being able to work quickly, that's something that really we've only talked about at the university level um, because we just don't have time. Our students are pushing right up to a deadline with their work printing out final boards, printing out final images, or displaying those on screen at the 11th hour and 59th <laughs> minute. Um, but now that we have something that has this opportunity to visualize really early on and visualize as part of the design process, we can start pushing this idea of building an interactive story, of building something that goes beyond um, simply a visual. I'm really excited about yeah, you know, I think a lot, I think um, a, a big change is that when I was doing architectural visualization, everyone at our viz firm came from an art school. Um, and the architects that we were working with were still doing stuff on paper. And, you know, you know, it was lots of white out and mechanical erasers and big boards with magnifying glasses and um it, it was kind of shocking to come from a very digital world into that world uh and see where they were working from where now uh, like you're saying junior architects are expected to do this as part of their job and therefore moving on it's architects that are doing this and and that is really powerful because like you were saying about vision before it was a visualization artist trying to interpret what a designer or an architect presented then. Um, and so there was always that barrier, um, but you needed that because that viz person needed to be really technical and know all this stuff about lighting and materials and render farms. And um, now handing that to the architect and designer that ability to tell those stories and create those visual and interactive stories is really powerful because as a viz artist, it was really hard for me to understand that vision. Um, and also because, you know, one day I'd be working on a bridge, the next day I'm working on a stadium, the next day I'm working on a, you know, a mansion in the forest. So <laughs> I, you know, I can't get into everyone's head as much as I would like. So them being able to do that themselves um, is one, it's really key to them telling these stories. And two, I think it's really powerful that that it's being taught in architecture schools and that, you know, the next generation of people doing these visualizations will be architects instead of artists, which, you know, not great for the viz artists out there, but. <laughs> Again, I've come from an architectural background and visualization background. And what interactivity really fascinates me is we can actually see the buildings the way in which our users see them. So, for instance, if you're making a school, you can see it from the perspective of the teachers. You can see it from the perspective of the students. You can see it from the perspective of differently abled students um, in a way that we couldn't actually experience before. And that, that really can inform design in a very impactful way. Well, shall we let David yeah. jump in and uh, and do some stuff in uh, Twin Motion? Please. All right. Are you ready? Yeah, I think so. Let me switch over to my screen share. All right. Let me unscreen share here. <laughs> Drum roll, please. Will all the okay. audio work? Right. And I, I'm seeing stuff change. Cool. Right. Good. Wind motion David. on screen. Now. We see it. 
Okay. Um, so really quick, how I start students learning twin motion. Um, a few things that I think are really relevant. Um, first of all, I really, um, one of the things that I really liked about this software is it feels like a playground. It feels like this virtual sandbox that you get to throw things into and just play. It turns design into play so that you can be at your most creative. Um, and that's really important to me for any piece of software that I'm doing. Um, other softwares, technical modelers, things like Revit, BIM, uh, can start to get there after you have a lot of experience and time in them, but it's much more difficult to get to that level. So while those modelers are still really important to this, um, I, I begin equating twin motion to a stage. So you have a prop department that's building props, that's building pieces, and then starts putting them on the stage and putting them in motion and bringing them to life. Um, so that said, I'm going to be showing a lot of different pieces of software that start combining all of those digital files into twin motion. That's sort of the workflow that I teach um, because there's a lot of software out that is very capable. Um, learning a bit about each one helps inform you which piece of software is going to do which thing and do it particularly well. So um, like any project, um, it starts with a site. So uh, a lot of the work that we do with building sites is simply um, finding the topography data. Um, so this is a location in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Um, right here, just above my cursor, is a small, very uh, historical church called Thorn Crown by Faye Jones. And so I'm going to be developing a little bit over that site um, and talk a little bit about the project that I'm working on with that. But what CAD Mapper does in particular, this is um, sort of a tool that um, builds a site for you, essentially. Um, and it's free to use unless you start grabbing more than a kilometer square of data. So in this software, um, you simply navigate to a location by searching whatever, tell it what type of format you want, what you're looking for, and then hit Create File. And that is going to build um, the 3D file for you. Right, so I'm, not, I'm going to spare everybody watching the download process and all of those things and simply switch back over to Revit, where I'm going to open up that file and talk a little bit about building that as a site and as a site that we can work with. Um, so uh, from there, I'm just going to do a file, um, or actually I'm going to, going to go to inserts, uh, insert import CAD. And then, uh, navigate to my folder that I've made for this talk. And um, CADMapper creates a DXF file, which is a little bit tricky to work with in Revit for a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, this is a fairly massive site. This is um, almost a kilometer. And if you notice, it brings it in um, at this size. Um, so completely the wrong scale. Um, done a little bit of work with this to kind of know the scale factors, which interestingly enough um, is 1000, exactly. Um, so in process in Revit, I'm simply unpinning that file and I am going to use um, scale and I'm going to select one corner and I'm going to scale this numerically by a factor of 1000. Now we have something much more appropriate in its scale and size. And I'm just going to drag that back about to the middle of my workspace. Um, so you can see the topography that's been created from that. Um, typically, next, I would simply convert this using the massing and site tools to an actual Revit um, topography. But the Revit topography tools still don't like to work with the XF files. So I've got one more short hoop to jump through with this, and that's simply an export and import. So I'm going to export this file as a DWG file. And then I'm going to import that file right back in. So um, back to insert, import CAD, 
switching my file type to DWG, and I'm going to be importing that site back in. Um, I'm then going to delete my DWG file, or my DXF file, excuse me, and then I'm going to use the site tools, the massing and site tool inside of Revit to create a topo surface out of this DWG file. So I'm going to be going to topo surface, create from import, select import instance, and I am just going to build that as my import file. So you can see right away, I now have topography lines. I have all of this data coming together as information that I can use. So let's uh, check box this. Um, let's see if I've got any points that I want to get rid of, which I do. Edit this surface really quickly here and get rid of these rogue points down here underneath. Those were actually the elevation tags. I turned those into topography as well. Sorry. There we go. Um, from here, I can delete that DWG file. So I'll unpin it and delete it. And I am going to change my topography to have a 10 foot depth. So it's much easier to read. So you can see I have something now that is both useful BIM data, building information modeling data, and is completely ready. The, the DXF file would be ready to shift as well into um, twin motion, but this gives me an opportunity to do just a few additional things. I'm going to go to my um, site plan view, and right about here where I know the building is, I'm going to put a building pad. This is going to create a flat location for me to place the building onto. That. And um, from here, I need to, Revit is very much about the building. The building is the center of the world, right? So I need to actually move my building. So in the process of doing that building pad, um, it's actually cut a great big hole down into the ground. So I need to actually move the site up to the building, which sounds a little bit odd, um, but for those of you not working in a program like Revit, somebody who might be receiving this data, every now and then you're going to see rogue things like this and sort of knowing the root of how um, an architectural modeling software works is really important, right? So I'm going to go back to my site and I'm going to cut a section through this so that I can manage the height of this topography. So a quick dimension string is going to tell me about how far I need to move the site. Um, looks like it's about 165, 167 feet vertical that it needs to move um, down to get closer to my base height of zero. So I'm just going to select the site, my move tool, and I'm going to move it 165 feet down. I'm going to select my building pad, change it back to zero, not 90, zero. And now if I look at this in 3D, I should see that building pad sitting nicely up above the topography. So the last piece that I want to do is edit this terrain. I'm going to select this group of points right here and set all of those to zero as well. This creates a little bit of a better site to manage and work with. Uh, it mitigates a little bit of the slope, which is um, very extreme at this particular site. So that I have a little bit more of an opportunity to work um, around the building. We'll accept that as a final value. And this is a file that I'm already ready to send into Twin Motion and start working with the site. Um, so it's probably a really good time to, to Lewis, ask and see if there's any questions that anybody would like me to cover. If I need to, I'm, I'm happy to do those. Um, and then what I'm going to do next is use the live sync in Twin Motion to send this. Um, for the live sync from Revit to send this directly over to Twin Motion. I don't see uh, no 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 great no questions just yet. 
Um, this, this is actually pretty cool for me to watch. Um, there's always, uh, everyone's got a different way of bringing in site data and getting it lined up with their, uh, with their Reddit model. Cause as you said, in Reddit, the building is everything. And in most other software, it's GIS based. Um, the, the building doesn't matter. So it throws stuff millions of kilometers out and all sorts of weird stuff. So it's, it's nice to see uh, someone else's workflow. And oh, look, he edits his terrain directly in Reddit. I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> so, so from here, I'm just going to go ahead and create the direct, the direct link, um, moving this directly into Twin. Um, that fast, you know, uh, I'm going to delete the default ground plane. Um, and this is a um, very rural site. Um, so before I do anything else, I know I need to come down to uh, my location and change my background from a city uh, to a countryside. Uh, and that's going to build something that's a little bit closer to what we're going to see. Um, next, I, you know, I can populate um, this entire site. I can turn this entire thing into a forest, uh, but save that. I, I'm really going to work just locally right around this area. So the first thing I'm going to do is select that building pad, hit the F key. Uh, I teach my students to think of the F key as focus. That's going to bring my view directly to that object. And um, I'm going to start putting just a few things onto the site. Um, so opening up the left tab. Oh, before I do that, just a little bit about how I teach the interface in Twin Motion. Um, it, really simple, right? Because I have a, a left, right option. Um, so this is materials and objects. This is the actors that I have on the stage or the parts that I have. And then some basic manipulations, especially switching from statistics to transform. This will tell me a little bit about my objects, its current scale and where it's at. So right now the building pad is selected. It is at 100% scale and it's located relative to itself at 000. zero, zero. Um, then from here, I'm often working uh, top down on the left-hand side, importing objects, um, creating content around or creating context. Um, the location, uh, localizing things, and then setting up different views, different images, and exporting. So, you know, it's a really, uh, if you're looking for something, following that logic of the software engineer, how this is laid out, super easy to do. Um, so the next thing really is to start populating just, uh, and again, I'm just going to work sort of locally around the project here. Um, let's get a little bit of a, um, ground cover material on. So this sort of grassy ground cover. Um, looks a little odd, perhaps, zoomed way out. Uh, looks great as you get the camera in, um, and especially as we start getting some cover around it. Um, so the next thing for me to do is the vegetation paint, um, which is uh, super easy and fast for me to work with. Um, and there's multiple ways of doing this. I can place one tree at a time. I can select an object and have it populate that entire object. I'm a big fan of paintbrushes, so I really like the paintbrush tool. Um, and so what I typically do is I drag a handful of the trees that I'm interested in, um, that I'd like on the site. And it, it's, um, it's important to note that all of this content comes with twin motion. All of these trees, all of these materials, this is all part of the package of twin motion. Is you don't have to learn how to make trees and grass and fancy materials that look good from far away and up close and go from winter to summer. You just drag and drop them in and there's great content already there for you even better in 2020 that was all part of the major improvements uh, in this version this latest version um from from there um I, I can set the density you know how dense i want you know if i want fewer spruce trees i can drop the density more oak trees i can raise the density 
Um, I'm simply going to select a paintbrush uh, and size that up a bit and paint where I want all of this to go, which for right now, um, I'm really interested in just working around the side. So once I have that, I can start moving it a little bit closer. And then I start working with a little bit more precision directly adjacent to the site. So I'm going to set up another sort of a second pass at the painting. Um, so I'm going to go back to my vegetation paint. This one is just going to be with, this is very much uh, a building in a forest. So I'm going to select, uh, again, some of this taller grass right here. Um, much smaller brush now in terms of my painting size. And now I can paint a little bit more adjacent to the building. Do that with a little bit higher density. Um, once I've painted something in, all I have to do is raise the density and it increases the population, which is fabulous. Um, and then once I have that, I can come in and start placing individual pieces um, to create that sort of really sort of intense density as well um, in terms of doing things more one at a time. So simply by dragging and dropping where I want some very specific things to come in at. Um, Back which is in my day, vegetation was the last thing we put in the scene because it made the render times go through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, totally, right? But I mean, just having this as a designer and being able to, and you can see I'm kind of keeping things a bit sparse right now. I'd certainly go back in and, and increase this, but having this kind of view right away to help you understand the design and what's going to happen to me is incredibly important, right? I, it's, it's, on its outset, it maybe it seems trivial, but just seeing this to visualize a design through, um, is remarkable. It's putting design in a living context, which is really, really nice. Um, so the next thing that I really get into to doing, and in terms of teaching, is an understanding of what is going to come from Revit. So let's put before I, I drop an entire building onto this, I do want to go back into Revit. and throw just a couple of quick things on, um, especially because this is a common problem that I see, that students feel like the software isn't doing its job, um, but in reality, it's, it's a feature. Uh, and it takes a little while for students to understand that and learn how to leverage this as a feature. But um, the reality is it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a feature. The software is meant to work this way. So I just have three um, clusters of walls, all of them 20 feet tall. This is just a default Revit wall type, um, a basic generic wall of eight inches. Uh, I'm going to hit save really quick inside of Revit and then relink this. Okay, so I have those boxes in. So if I wanted this to have, um, let's say amazing Ondo Concrete. Um, I can go to the amazing Ondo Concrete texture that exists. So I'm just going to navigate to Concrete, scroll down, um, port in place Concrete, and that is going to place that Concrete on all of my walls, right? But if I want this wall to be something different, um, let's say I want that to be a rain screen out of wood, it's going to change the material on all of those walls. Um, so getting the software, navigate around to the sunny side so you can see that a little bit better. Getting the software to, to work with Revit um, is really important. Um, understanding why twin motion is, is reacting this way um, to that geometry is really important. Essentially, it is looking for the materials that you've assigned in Revit. And rather than having to paint every surface, you are overriding all of those materials. So if I want three different wall types, three different textures across this, I, the best way to do that is to create those new wall types inside of Revit. So if I jump back to that software, um, I can simply come in, select this group of walls. I'm going to edit this type on my wall, duplicate it, 
and let's name this uh, eight inch rain screen. Then I'm going to edit the structure to edit the material. I'm going to create a new material and rename that material. There we go to wood rain screen. And in its appearance, um, this is often where, you know, uh, three years ago, four years ago, I would do an entire breakdown of how to apply a Revit material, how to create texture maps, all of that kind of stuff. Um, now, um, I have switched that around to, and this is where inside of Revit, you're going to create a schematic color for that material. Um, because what we can do in Twin, the visualization is so much more powerful that that's simply a better approach, especially in your early work. So again, um, with this other box, let's do this one as, uh, again, I'm going to duplicate that wall family. So that will be generic eight inch old brick. Um, and so again, on that old brick family, I need to change its material to a new material. And I will rename that brick. Old, simply because Revit alphabetizes all the material. So under brick old, again, we'll give that uh, a bit of a bricky color. Technically speaking, bricky color. And now graphically, I can see that I have three different materials here. So if I do, again, um, quick save, synchronize this with Twin Motion. I can see now I have my three different materials set up and ready to go. So I can place on this middle one, my uh, rain screen material, um, scale that up a little bit, um, just because it matters to me a lot. Let's go ahead and drop um, somebody in um, for scale. Okay, yeah, there we go, um, because scale matters. Let's get um, the Ondo concrete working again. Right here, scale that up as well. And then on this one, um, did something sort of intentional, tr intentionally tricky because there's actually not a good old brick. There's this sort of dirt brick which is okay, but there's not a lot of sort of uh, rustic looking brick um, inside of Twin. Um, so one of the things that I, I like to walk through, again, early in the process is how you build your own texture maps, because it doesn't matter. You know, um, the, the team at Twin Motion could give us 5,000 materials. You're going to want that one that you saw on a website or on a project or out, in, um, out on an architectural tour or something um, to do in a completely different way. So building your own material is super simple. Um, and there's several ways to do it. Um, the method that I typically teach is to go right here to the materials and settings, add a new material, and I'm going to rename that old brick. So on that material, um, let's just go ahead and drop it onto that object so we can see it update as I move through. Um, from here, underneath the color tab, I can go to more, and I am going to open up uh, texture map that I've built already. So we're going to go to my folder for this. And let's establish the scale on that as well. Scale that up just a bit. And real time uses a different method. This is, um, again, back to the old school. We would be applying a bump map. And in Twin Motion, this is still going to be called a bump, but we're applying it using uh, real time, um, which is actually going to be a normal map. And normal maps, there's uh, several online builders of normal maps that are fabulous. Um, the one that I like to use in particular is normal map online. And so that same brick texture I have uploaded um, there are a series of sliders, and why I like this one is it gives you a preview of the impact of that normal map. Uh, again, think of this, if you've been doing this for a while, this is a bump map, but this is what a real-time engine is going to use. It creates this sort of 
um, various shades of blue, which is going to impact how light interacts with the surface, it's going to create that sort of sense of reality. And what this allows me to do is I can set how much blur that I want. In other words, the resolution, if I go too far, um, I get too gritty with the brick. I'm really interested in the mortar and a little bit of attention to detail on the surface of the brick in terms of how light is going to play off of it. Um, from here, you simply download that file. And then inside of Twin Motion, you are coming to um, Settings, going to the Bump Map and More, and opening up that same file as a normal map. So I typically just teach my students put a normal suffix on the end. Um, those two things should match up perfectly as long as they've been generated from each other. And then I increase that pretty drastically to begin to create um, a little bit more of an interaction with light. The one piece of this that really keeps you in the uncanny valley, and that's something that looks real and isn't quite unreal, is this edge. You know, so if I was really going to push this, I would actually want to come back and model this so this edge was a little bit looser rather than this really tight, sharp edge. But in terms of doing early visualization, quick visualization of things, um, this is a method that um, really begins to get your own ideas, your own texture maps, things that you've seen out and about applied really quickly inside of the Twin Motion file. This is another quick pause moment for me, I think. Um, see if there's questions, things like that, that I can answer. And while I'm doing that, what I'm going to do is go back into Revit and clear this stuff out and update the scene. All right, so we've got a question uh, about uh, material assignment. And um, do you have to... Um, do you the only way to change the material on a per object basis is to go back into Revit and change the material there, or is there a way you wanted to to do that completely within? Tom, I'm going to defer that question to you. How I how I teach it is to move back into Revit or the modeling software and update the materials there. Um, there's some relevance from my end in terms of how I teach architecture to mm. make sure that there's some continuity in that base model. Um, but in terms of visualization, I don't know if there is a good workaround simply because I haven't thought that. No, I think I think that that's, that's a really, really good consideration. But oftentimes, you don't want to fix it in the visualization model. You want to fix it in the design model. Um, especially moving forward, you know, if it's something that every time you update this model, you're going to have to fix it in Twin Motion because it's got the wrong material on it. Twin Motion has some intelligence in it to try and apply the right material, but um, it's always best to fix that in the source. I do think that there's an option to be able to bring in your model uh, separated by by like group or some other options other than separated by material. Um, so you could do it that way, but yeah, I think uh, fixing it in, in your source content and your design data is typically good kind of stuff. Yeah, some, sometimes there's speed and sometimes there's best mode of practice. Um, yeah. And that's, uh, I, I often, guiltily uh, for sure, will often teach speed because I'm interested in, in the results, but that is one of the times where referencing back to, um, especially if you're working in BIM, uh, Archicad or Revit or Bentley, um, having those things assigned correctly there does not. Um, it's, it's tapping more into just how those materials appear. Um, and so that, that to me is, is a relevant uh, part of the process. Cool, great answer, thanks. Good question too, um, and you know, and I would say uh, a, a lot of the stuff that I teach, how I put this stuff together, um, we try and communicate this out often. So you know, um, I'm I'm a pretty easy person to find. If you do have questions, 
certainly filter those through Lewis or Tom um, or Mark um, and, and be happy to chat with anybody um, later on uh, about this and the techniques. Um, so to continue on um, with the visualization, and obviously I'm not going to put this together in an incredibly seamless way. I'm trying to work really fast so we can get through a lot of content. Um, but getting into the chapel itself, um, a lot of times you have assets coming together from multiple sources. So if you notice this, this in terms of Revit, and I've done this intentionally for right now, I haven't put this onto the site. I haven't merged those two things together just yet, but I'm going to use twin motion to actually begin merging them together and do a slightly different import process. Um, and this is actually the process that I often prefer to do. Um, the, the linking is really incredible. Um, and if I'm working back and forth trying to resolve materials, that might be the right choice for me to go with. Um, but a lot of times I am working um, towards a goal in twin motion. And what I will do often is um, rather than using the live link, I will come in and do a file. So this needs to be from a 3D view so that I'm getting 3D objects out. But I will come in and do a file export FBX out of Revit. Um, I'm just going to name this Thorn Crown and put a slight suffix on it. That's my test piece from earlier today. Um, so the FBX file type um, comes in great. Um, it's going to show up a little bit different in terms of its materiality. It's going to give me sort of a default material, which I don't mind terribly too much. Um, but inside of Twin Motion now, I can simply go to my import button and select my file. And it's going to place that in the scene. Um, as you can see, like I said, it, it's given me um, sort of a single material on this for right now. Um, but beginning to update those is incredibly fast. Um, you know, uh, typically on a building, especially one that's almost entirely glass, I would start with updating the glass first. And again, everything that had that label of glass inside of Revit. Um, it's all of the glass in one pass, so super easy. Um, next is coming to the inside, and I'm not going to do this with all of the materials, but just a handful of them. Um, I can use my material selection tool. So that is the um, object, um, the default material that was assigned to that. Um, and I'm simply going to update that to something that is more like what is in the actual chapel, which is sort of this, uh, it's, not a ghastly yellow. It is more of a um, light tan color. And from here, if I look at the color, I can grab um, hexadecimal color and use my dropper then to just copy and paste that back in. because it is fairly mono inside of there. I mean, it's really about, this is about a building in a forest, and how it's transparent. Um, this portion, however, is slightly different. That is a um, set of stones that come directly out of the ground for the slab. I'm not quite right with this. This would be one that, um, it, it's such an exceptional chapel that I, I feel a little bit guilty applying this because it is a very special particular type of stone native to the area found on site. But this is getting at the idea really, really quickly, again, in terms of that visualization. Um, just dropping that on, and it's even dropped on the floor, except the floor, um, it's these massive slates that are about three to four feet across. So rather than using this same stone again, because if I adjust the scale, it's going to adjust the scale on all of them, I'm going to go back to that same stone again, create a different version of it so I can scale that up. And I did something wrong in those steps. I'll have to go back and review that again later. Um, <laughs> I meant to grab, I might have grabbed the wrong one. Well, nope, I'm still got it that a little bit off, but that gets us at the idea. Um, so, what I wanted to do last with this 
is look really quickly at lighting because this again it's another thing that tom and i've had a conversation about as well that is just uh, well just to be honest it's pretty greedy how this works um if i were to go into the libraries this is this is something that that we would spend um uh, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to spend a week trying to do a nighttime rendering scene, trying to track things, get things working correctly. But uh, in this chapel, um, all of these uh, are sconces that are along the surface. And so I've just got a default light, and I'm going to move that into the sconce. I'm going to change my speed. So the speed tab lets me move car speed, bike speed, or walking speed. So as I get a little bit more detailed, um, I need to slow down how fast I zip around. So changing that to sort of a walking speed becomes really important. Uh, so I'm going to zoom out with that light. I'm going to set my shadows, uh, my radius rather, to be a sphere of influence that doesn't quite go from sconce to sconce. Um, I'm going to set my intensity at about 100 lumens. And from here, um, let's just put this in one more. So I'm going to drop that right about here. And so that was, I just did a shift click and move to make those two objects instances of each other. So I should have two lights now um, whose properties are going to be cloned. Um, spending more time on this, I would put one of those lights in every sconce. But from here, um, I can simply go to my visualization tab and change my time of day right into the evening. And those light up almost exactly like you would expect them to, um, which to me is, uh, for somebody who, who again, has, has done this for two decades, um, it's, it's really not fair. Um, but remarkable. <laughs> I absolutely love that I have access to it. I love that um, the night sky shows up through this, that you can start seeing stars, that these lights, they just work. Um, even without shadows on, um, that it works in real time, that I can start building this um, atmosphere and ambience right away with this sort of intense immediacy. Um, the last thing that I had on my list was bringing something in from Quixel. Um, so I can do that really quickly, or we can open it up for more questions, comments. Um, but this is really the, the bulk of what I wanted to cover is, is already in place, just how quickly, um, especially given a model, that we can get in and start to look at objects, surfaces, locations, manipulations, um, and, and just create um, some absolutely amazing images. Um, that shouldn't look that good already. <laughs> no, um, just so, so quickly. Um, By all rights, that shouldn't be that good. You should need to spend three or four years doing visualization to be able to set up a sun and sky to have the right values so that it doesn't look like total garbage. And then, and then yeah, like you said, Whenever someone would want that night version of the render, it was always, it just caused so much anxiety. Because <laughs> you weren't totally. sure that you could actually get it to render. You know, sometimes you'd throw in all the lights and you'd hit render, you'd go home for the night, you'd come back the next day and it would just tell you, sorry, too many lights, buddy. <laughs> And now Absolutely. it's like, just set it tonight and put in the lights and look. It, oh, you want to do a transition from day to night? Oh, yeah, we, we'll do that for you. I used to have to like talk, talk clients down from the edge where they were like, yeah, I want a full transition from day to night. And I'm like, no, you can't <laughs> afford that. <laughs> I want to do that too, but... Uh, that's going to be tough. Yeah, and as you could see in the demo reel that I showed from 315, that was one of my students' favorite things. Um, that idea of how a building, you know, a, a building, you know, um, a third of the time or more is going to be in a dark condition. Um, and we don't design for that very often. We, we design um, thinking about how it's going to look in daylight. Um, 
but as my students got into that, it started looking really at how transparency and layering and opacity, translucency are all materials that are impacted greatly by light in the, in the, the day to night cycle um, and what can be done with that. Um, uh, and, and just a lot of fun, uh, just a lot of opportunity to experiment and play with this set of design tools that, that really uh, we just haven't had. Oh, there is a question about, uh, you know, can you do a test render, you know, to show the render speed? And I think that that's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, you know, it's it's not instant, for sure, but um, it's close. Um, relative to, I think, what um, Tom and I have experienced in our history, it is instant. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of additional work that I would typically want to go into this, you know, that this is too big. It's not quite why I'd want to scrunch this in. So I'm not exactly sure um, of what my quality is going to be, but I don't really have to care because this isn't going to be a multiple, multiple hour render or often what I would use to see um, multiple day kind of render. Um, so essentially I'm creating an image. Uh, then I'm coming into my export function. I'm selecting that image to be rendered. So I've got image one. Um, let's look really quickly at the type. Um, I'm just I'm just going to pretty much run with the defaults on this for right now. Um, location, yeah, and I think I'm I'm really happy with just the defaults. Um, I'm going to hit start exports. Select where those are going to be saved. So I'm just going to continue saving and working directly out of this folder for the talk. Let's call this exterior. Uh, it's going to take me longer to uh, get the, the file <laughs> set up and ready to run, I'm quite sure, than, than, than this, actually. There we go, select folder. Um, so estimated time left computing. Um, yeah, it's done. Um, let's see here. Hopefully, I have that available. That should be titled that image one. Yeah, right here. Um, created. That's uh, not even fair. Exactly a second ago. Um, and there you go. Um, you know, so, you know, immediately the things that I would get into, obviously, if I've got more work to do in the model in terms of bringing the, the footprint of the building in tighter. Um, but this lighting around it, that's just not fair. Um, and, uh, you know, I would definitely play with depth of field, get a little bit more foreground, background, and increase the entourage immediately around the building. But that, it, again, it took me longer to navigate to the folder than to, to actually build the rendering. Um, which is why, you know, in terms of creating video, in terms of creating a, an animated walkthrough, um, that was one of my ambitions when I started teaching 12 years ago, was I'm going to introduce animation. I'm going to have students using animation tools, we're going to build walkthroughs, it's going to be amazing. We never had time. I would say in eight years leading up to some, some of the real-time software, um, maybe three or four animations for final reviews uh, in eight years. Um, in 315, it was a requirement. Um, so last fall, it was a requirement that every student had a minute and a half long animation, which is what oh, we call yeah. demo reel. Um, because, you know, if, if it can do a rendering that fast, um, rendering out 30 frames per second, you know, it takes a few minutes to render um, that full animation. And then one of the things that uh, really I enjoy even more than the animation, and I think that this should work. Um, I did set everything up, but I didn't test it. Yeah, no. Um, so I did hook in my Oculus Rift before coming. And so, yeah. Um, it's ready to go. Um, I'm going to speak awesome. really loudly because having done this before, um, I oh, I need to set up my position um, in there. So there's actually a, a download happening right now in the Oculus software um, that's setting up my position, but that immediately switched over to VR um, just at the click of a button and then hitting escape brings me back to, to this world, um, which is just ridiculously cool. Let's see. I wonder if I can hit... Um, just close that out of Oculus and bring that back. Get set up. George Clooney's not as good looking as me, by the way. 
ったおー<笑><笑>
That's great. There was a question about uh, clay render styles uh, so that you can make everything monochrome real quickly, that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of materials and there's actually a material pack on our marketplace that's free as well. Yeah, I'm not sure about render styles and motion. Um, there's several, right? Um, so clay render um, is here. Right, um, which uh, I use often. Um, so it's basically you can think of it. There's two really good purposes for this. The first one is if you are uber advanced and you get really picky, exporting these renders twice, once as a clay render and then once as um, your full. Uh, color image, you, you can actually use that clay render in Photoshop as an overlay to adjust some of your lighting mm. Um, mm. To, to really enhance areas, which is really nice. The other time, like if I'm working with a client, because I, I don't only teach, sometimes I, I do practice as well. If I am working with a client, this kind of rendering can be really nice if I'm not ready to talk about materials. Yet. Because oftentimes a client is going to talk about what they know which often is brick, I don't like that brick, um, or I, well, it shouldn't be wood, I want this. We're early on in a project, you might only be ready to talk about space and form and context. And this can really mm -hmm. help steer those conversations. So mm -hmm. for instance, one of our studios that we have here is called Community Studio. That's for our fourth year students. And they work directly with um, clients. Um, usually they're small cities. Cities have a population of around 2,000 or 3,000, and they have specific needs. And in terms of communicating, if they went in two weeks in with this as a rendering, the conversation with the client becomes, well, you're done. Um, what input is there left for me to provide? I, I, I really wanted to talk with this. There are specific things that I wanted. Um, and it's just as simple as that, just changing something that starts to look more realistic, that starts to look finished, to changing something that looks like this, the conversation completely changes. Mm -hmm. um, a client begins to understand that this is work in progress, that this is something that they can shape and they can mold with you, which is typically what we're wanting as a designer as well. Um, so those are the two uses that I really see for that. And the fact that there's a button for it um, again, uh, it's, it's, I, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm old, so I teeter between it's awesome and it's annoying, um, but I'm going to land on it's, it's awesome, um, that I can just click that button and then I'm ready to have that conversation and I don't have to create an overwrite for all the materials and then all that kind of stuff or try and do something in Photoshop to desaturate. Um, it's just a button, right? And I can do that on any specific image that I'm working with. So I can output a series of clay renderings. I can output a series of photo reel or closer to photo reel images, um, all just by varying those settings um, inside of my camera. Great. There was also a question about collision. So content coming in from Revit or SketchUp, uh, that comes in with collision, or do you need to generate your own collision? Or when you're going in in VR, what uh, challenges were you going to run into with collision? Um, typically the only thing that, well, I, I'll back that question up. So I do um, quite a bit of consulting with architecture firms on this. And one of the things that um, architecture firms have started doing is actually this idea of um, using this as their collision detection software um, or using a real-time engine as their collision detection software. So they're actually dropping it in, they're bringing in their files from structural MEP, and, every, and actually navigating through it um, using the real-time tools to see what is really there and what is working and catching things that they wouldn't have otherwise caught in, again, in this sort of atmosphere that is uh, more conducive to exploration. Um, the, the thing that I see the most in terms of merging multiple pieces of software is what I was showing in Revit when I initially brought that site um, topography in, and that is scale. Making sure that the scales of different objects match up. 
Um, right now, um, bringing things from SketchUp, bringing things from Archicad, bringing things from Formit, which I use a lot. I actually prefer Formit um, over SketchUp by quite a bit. My, my kids know that um, here. Uh, um, uh, all of those, the, the scale lines up. Uh, and as long as you are keeping things, um, my advice often is keep, to keep things close to the origin. I, you know, when we're working on these larger sites, which we often do, you know, this one is um, almost um, a kilometer across. When working on these larger sites, I typically don't try and position everything. Uh, it's easy enough to move things around into a motion. I don't try and position things in their correct location from the different pieces of the software. I get them close to the origin. Um, getting it close to the origin, and by that I mean zero, zero, zero on the Cartesian coordinate axis. If I've done that, the uh, widget for the object, or Tom, what did you refer to these as? Gizmos. The gizmos. That is going to be also close to the center of your object, which is very handy in terms of working with this. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. I will have students that will build something um, literally a mile away in Revit, um, and then it can be difficult to manipulate the object. So I, I typically have them reorganize it in whatever their core modeler is, get that object closer to the origin so that the gizmo or the widget is right here so it's easy to, to manipulate and move around and get that to do what it needs. I hope that answers the question in terms yes, of collision. There's yes, yes, yes. Several different directions I could go with the word collision. Um, yeah. But I was thinking about, you know, uh, construction collision and then this sort of yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, mode of different scales that would come in. I, I think the other thing that I would mention that my students have learned to really watch for um, are coplanar objects. Oh, so yeah. if you are working on a real time, this this is something that I did learn how to deal with um, all the way back when I was working in animation. If you have two objects that are in the same place, that are coplanar, two different pieces of geometry in the same place, and they have two different materials on them, you're going to see a flicker. Um, that happens, you'll see that in games often. Um, if the modeling is a little bit sloppy, uh, you would see that in animations, pre-built animations that we would run, um, and that was something we would always fight because you wouldn't know it until you had compiled the animation and the uh, mm -hmm. Uh, in, in the software, in the nonlinear video editor, like Premiere or Final Cut or something like that, you wouldn't see it until you know a few days after rendering sometimes, and then have to go back and fix everything. Um, with with Twin Motion, uh, on occasion, and Revit is notorious about giving you coplanar geometry. You'll see this sort of um, flickering between two objects, and that's going back in and figuring out which face to um, edit and delete or hide. Um, before importing it in. Um, I've been working with this file for a while, so I, I've intentionally tried to omit them. Um, but you can see a little bit the seam between the glass and the vertical yeah, that's supports really common mm -hmm. spot. right here. Yeah. Um, and that's simply because I have this polygon that's creating the glass that's running down this side that's coming back. And so they are sharing a face. So my solution for that would be to do what is actually in the building, which is a small mullion right here. So actually fixing that is actually going to increase the um, the relevance of that model and the accuracy of that model as well. So that's something that's still need to get back in there. So again, that's that's another direction that I can kind of take with that idea of collision as well. So um, there's a lot of different a lot of different ways that that could go. So I hope I hope I answered that. One. Fantastic. Yeah. This was such a cool demonstration. Yeah, and really appreciate uh, you joining us today. I, I think, um, I mean, just to actually have a, an architect come in as well as a professor of architecture come in and, and drive the tool set has been very edifying and uh, really appreciate you sharing your time with us today. And uh, I think the, the folks attending today's uh, stream really, really enjoyed it. Um, we are running really long on today's stream. So, you know, guys, if you wanted to ask any more questions, I'm going to throw up how you can get a hold of us once again. Feel free to reach out to us at ueacademia at epicgames.com and we'll be sure to forward any messages and uh, make sure that uh, David gets um, the questions that you ask. And, and uh, you see our Twitter handles on the bottom, so you can always reach out to us through Twitter as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
once again, thank you guys, everyone, for joining us today uh, on the stream, David, Tom, Mark, and uh, next week we Mark. are having another really awesome stream. We're going to be joined by uh, Lisa Tenorio, who's the head of global education for Epic Games, and Linda Salheim, who's one of our education managers. We're going to be talking about um, the Creators Field Guide that we created, uh, as well as uh, some really helpful research that we did about understanding what's happening in real time and, and uh, the demand for real time developers as a whole. And, and uh, Seven Siegel will also be joining us uh, to talk about the fast track program and the outcomes of that program. So uh, will be another really helpful stream, the focus once again on the educator community. Uh, and then we've got some great streams coming up also inviting uh, Shor DeYoung, who's uh, been with Epic for a very long time to talk about uh, some courses that he created for uh, our online learning platform and um, some um, just amazing content that they've been building for um, um, just the depth of the engine and uh, and the the width of the engine. So um, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Uh, again, thank you very much, David. Please remember, go to twinmotion.com. We'll take you to the Unreal Engine site. I shared the links to... Uh, the material that we were looking at today uh, and you can go there and, and look at all the web pages on the educational uh, resource site uh, teaching you how to install Unreal Engine for lab use and, and giving you all the details about the academic use of Twin Motion. Uh, make sure that you go and get it. This once again, if you are an academic institution, is free and um, Make sure that you are teaching it, even if once again you're teaching in a game program, your students should be working in, in Twin Motion, prototyping in Twin Motion. It's an amazing gameplay space, prototyping space. And so um, it's been fun. We've had a great time today. And I hope you all have a great weekend. And thank you again for joining us. Bye. See you next week. See you next week. All right. Cheers, all. Bye.